everyone. <clears throat> Just taking a moment to see all the faces. Oh, Chris, you managed to get him in front of a computer. <laughs> a private joke. There. Let's enjoy our, uh, our few minutes of sitting. When we complete uh, our sitting, I'm going to screen share a, a chant that is different than the verse of the robe, which we would ordinarily do, uh, like I did last time. Uh, because I'd like for us to focus on it, uh, given this Thanksgiving uh, in America, a Thanksgiving week. So. to take the time to simply sit together in this way. And to just rest with your own breathing without 
any manipulation, just noticing and resting with your own breath. as a way to appreciate your life, the fact that you are alive with the whole bed of sorrows and joys and celebrations and griefs, everything that we hold in these bodies that are breathing and which are alive together. It's a way to very quietly and humbly and graciously offer thanks, to give thanks, to feel gratitude for being alive and to be with others, with these wonderful people. for just a little longer. Sitting with each breath. Taking it all in with each inhalation and offering it back on each exhalation. If you're willing, open your eyes so you can take in the, the people that show in front of you and maybe it's a strange thing to think as if you're breathing with your eyes so you're offering yourself through each little square to, to your friends and taking them in holding them in your heart with each breath. And as you hear the bell, and we offer our gentle bow to each other, it's a way of acknowledging that you've, you've seen your friends and you've appreciated them seeing you as we've been breathing together.
And the uh, chant that I will um, share with you now is one we haven't focused on, but it's, I think, a useful one this week of, as I said, I know not all of you are coming here from the United States, but we're having our American uh, Thanksgiving holiday. So we're going to look at the meal chant. <clears throat> The chant that we utilize at Apoplano. And if you would uh, say it with me, as we do all the chants, um, you can see that there is a segment that is um, usually chanted by one of the leaders at breakfast and one of the leaders at lunch. It's different. We're going to walk our way through the whole thing from the beginning to the end, just so you get a feel for it. And many of you are quite familiar with this, uh, but some of you not. So, so let's just walk through it together, okay? As we begin our meal, may we and all existence be relieved from self-clinging. Thus food comes from the efforts of many workers past and present, and its ten advantages give us health and well-being and promote strong practice. We offer this meal of three qualities and six tastes to everyone, everywhere, and to all the life of the universe. Seventy-two labors brought us this food. We should know how it comes to us. As we receive this offering, we should consider whether we understand its nature. As we desire the natural order of mind to be free from clinging, we must be aware of our greed. We take this food to support our life. We take this food to attain the way. First, this food is for true practice. Second, it is for our teachers and parents. Third, it is for all nations and all beings. Thus, we eat this food with everyone. We eat to stop all harming, to practice serving, and to accomplish the awakened way. May we exist like a lotus at home in the muddy water. Thus, we bow to life as it is. As I've said, I know some of you are quite familiar with this, and some of you maybe not quite so familiar. Um, I was actually speaking with Joel um, Barna a few days ago, and we were talking about the inspirational feel of this, um, this meal chant. And because we're entering this week, uh, which brings us to the American uh, Thanksgiving on Thursday, Even those of us here in this country forget that it's in some ways a celebration of gratitude for the kindness and generosity of other people. Uh, Native peoples met the the people who arrived on the, the shore of this continent and helped them. And the, it's a celebration of a successful harvest, which was a direct result of life-saving help and an acknowledgement of the interdependence that we actually actually live with and for and with. But now in our contemporary world, it's mostly about food, <laughs> about what we cook and how we get together and how we're cooked by getting together with our family too. Uh, and um, I know that's not just at Thanksgiving. Christmas is right around the corner. And, you know, although that's another celebration of uh, a birth of a great being into the world and bringing uh, light into the world, it's mostly about buying things, about consumerism and giving gifts. These 
holidays get transformed, but I really want to talk about food and our, our meals. Um, and as I was preparing uh, to just make a few comments about this and invite you to come forward, uh, so we deepen our practice together. I received an email, as many of you did yesterday, if you're subscribed to the tricycle, little things that you get each day in emails. And it was a piece um, by Lou Richmond, um, a senior teacher in the Soto Zen tradition. And in it was a small story. And there was a story about uh, Suzuki Roshi in the early days at Tassajara being approached by one of the students who had a bit of an edge um, and almost an axe to grind. And he came to Suzuki Roshi extolling the virtues of brown rice and how it's important to eat brown rice. And of course, brown rice is not eaten in Japan. It's white rice. And he was looking to try to get Suzuki Roshi to uh, agree with him that this was a better thing. And after listening to his long explanation, Suzuki Roshi turned to him and said, food is very important. And then turned around and left. And the young man's face was kind of, didn't exactly know what to do. Food is very important. And aside from the food, one of the beautiful things that Suzuki Roshi was doing was meeting someone on common ground with respect and by his comment, shifting the level of the conversation away from the, uh, the, the hook, the bait, which some of you might anticipate feeling when you <laughs> arrive with families, if you're going to be with families during this holiday. Because food is a core spiritual value and teaching in Buddhism through which we experience the interconnection with all beings, as well as gratitude, those qualities of thanksgiving. And when we're in retreat in an intensive or if um, we're in a monastic setting and eating uh, orioki, those meals in the meditation hall are formal rituals. They're not just about getting food. And so before each meal, we chant something similar to the chant that we just did together to appreciate the food. And in part of that, you know, it said 72 labors brought us this food. We should know how it comes to us. So eating is an opportunity to directly experience these teachings and the reality of our interdependence. And it doesn't matter what kind of food it is. In the ancient way, when Buddhist monks were mendicants, they would go with their bowls and they would be given food by um, the people who would offer them sustenance. And they were expected to eat what they were given without preference. And so when Suzuki said, food is very important, without making it really explicit, he placed himself and his student on common ground. Well, this is something we can agree on. And he did so respectfully without challenging him or succumbing to the challenge. And, but then he moved the conversation to a deeper level by leaving the student with, with a question. There are other curious stories that I've heard over time in which for example, Suzuki Roshi would be very provocative and playful, but still looking for common ground, respect, and shifting the level of the conversation, because that's what we do in, in Zen practice. That's what we do in inquiry. During one time at Tassajara, when they were doing a lot of work, Suzuki Roshi uh, injured his finger, and so someone had to drive him into Carmel Valley to the, the hospital or the doctor to get some help. And, um, into, into Monterey, actually, and when they were coming back, uh, Suzuki said, I'm, I'm hungry. And the young man that was driving him was a very strict vegetarian and kind of a, 
militant about it and he kept waiting to find a restaurant that would, would be suitable and Suzuki Roshi said, no, pull in here. And it was a, uh, a cheap drive-in a hamburger stand. But so the student sat down with Suzuki Roshi and he f saw on the menu that he had order a grilled cheese sandwich, which he did. And Suzuki Roshi ordered a hamburger. When the food arrived, the student looked at his grilled cheese sandwich and um, wasn't quite sure what to do. Suzuki Roshi took a bite of his hamburger and said, I don't like mine, let's switch. And he just pushed the hamburger to the guy and took his grilled cheese sandwich. And so the student, suddenly the tables were turned and he had to decide what to do. During another time at Tassajara, they were making Kool-Aid during the summer. Uh, not Kool-Aid, <laughs> lemonade. And almost everyone, of course, being quite pure, didn't want to use any sugar, especially, you know, white sugar that's refined. And one day there was a big pitcher of lemonade out uh, during the break and uh, during afternoon tea. And Suzuki Roshi walked up and offered, um, someone offered him a glass of lemonade and he said, is there sugar in it? And he said, oh no, there's no sugar. And so Suzuki Roshi said, Where, where's the sugar? And he put like heaps of sugar, he like filled the glass halfway up with sugar and then drank it down to everyone's amazement. So these are ways that he was acting in a provocative, playful way to change the level of the conversation to say, don't take yourself and don't think, take things too seriously. Don't get stuck. Don't get stuck. Other times we offer just the opposite. Take your practice seriously. You know, in the 13th century, there's a famous story where Dogen, when he was in China, met a Tenzo at a Chinese temple that he had a lot of respect for. And it was an old man and he was drying mushrooms out in the sun and working really hard. And Dogen said to him, uh, why don't you get your assistants to help you? This is hard. You're an old man. This is really hard. And the Tenzo looked at him and said, I'm not other people. He said, get other people to help. He said, I'm not other people. In the same way, we have to realize that this life is the only life we have. It's ours. It's not some other person's life. And if we don't do the cooking of our lives ourselves, we're going to throw our life away. Dogen said, keep your eyes open. Like I ask you to do, keep your eyes open, wash the rice thoroughly, put it in the pot, light the fire, cook it. As the old Tenzos would teach, you know, see the pot as your own head and see the water as your lifeblood. Cook like everything depends on it, your whole life, because it does. And when we cook and when we live with this kind of attention, the most ordinary acts and the humblest ingredients end up being revealed as they truly are. Dogen would say, handle even a leaf of green in such a way that it manifests the body of the Buddha. This in turn allows the Buddha to manifest through the leaf. So we can be playful on the one hand, and we can be very, very serious. And they're both important depending on how we want to meet things. But the, the Tenzo, which some of you might not know that term is the name of the head of the, the kitchen in the in a monastery, is in monastery. And it's a very high ranking position. And the kitchen is as sacred as the Buddha hall or the Zendo. But it's cooking is practicing transformation. Cooking is practicing the art of transformation. And what are we transforming in practice? Our life. We're practicing the transformation of our lives. And in our life, we like open the refrigerator of our life or the cupboard and we see what ingredients are there. How are we gonna make a meal out of this? How are we gonna make a meal from this 
life with these people under these circumstances with this body how are we going to make this life of these ingredients and we're asked to use everything not to waste anything in our life to use everything to meet everything fully to not waste anything or turn away from anything in, our, in life and we're also asked to clean up when we're finished and leave no trace to take care of things in our life so in the kitchen we practice transformation of foods using all the ingredients not wasting anything cleaning up but in our everydayness we're practicing because we're transforming we understand the transformation of life of living and we have to pay attention to the ingredients of our life and to not waste our precious life and to clean up and not leave paths of destruction or harm in our life and this is what we learn in the kitchen um i want to say a few more things about the, the meal chant so it comes to life um, when we began um, with the statement that says as we begin our meal may we in all existence be relieved from self-clinging in other words as we live our lives as we begin our meal as we live our lives may we along with everyone and everything soften our clinging to the self-centered dream as we begin our meal of our life may we in all existence be relieved from self-clinging that's the fundamental aspect of our practice as we live every day with everyone else we can soften our clinging in fact in the monastic chant which isn't in our chant when we are using our orioki bowls it says now that we set up buddha's bowls may we with all beings realize the emptiness of the three wheels giver receiver and gift we open ourselves to the um, deep flow of care and generosity that comes with our thanksgiving the small statement at breakfast the leader says this food comes from the efforts of many workers past and present and its ten advantages give us health and well-being and promote strong practice remember that you live every single day by the generous offerings and efforts of other people and the nourishment that you receive makes everything else possible sometimes Aaron and I will see the barge coming from Honolulu and we think thank thank you without the barge we don't have food or at least we don't have all the food we get some food but we get many things it comes from the efforts of many workers past and present there's a small verse that we sometimes chant is we revere the three treasures and give thanks for this food the work of many people and the transformation of other forms of life so that at breakfast we say remember that we live because of what we've been given and then at lunch we say we offer this meal of three qualities and six tastes to everyone everywhere and to all the life of the universe at breakfast we say we remember we're taken care of by the world and at lunch we say because of the gifts we receive we're going to offer our lives back to the world to be generous and then the rest of the chant says you know the 72 labors brought us this food we should know how it comes to us as we receive this offering we should consider whether we understand its nature basically do you really understand what it means to have food and in america at least for those of us online right now we probably don't have what is being called food insecurity much of the time but there are many people who do we're the rare people on earth who don't do you understand what it means to have food and to have it readily available and to appreciate it so we don't need to go through the entire chant but 
remember at this Thanksgiving holiday, can we remember that our practice is to nourish ourselves and to serve others? So can we find common ground with the people that we meet when we sit around a table? People that we may feel very distant from right now in some ways, in our families or in the world. We nourish ourselves and offer nourishment and serve others. Secondly, can we treat everything as sacred? Like each green, like Dogen told us, and meet each other with respect, even if we disagree, even if we have difficulties. Can we appreciate and receive what we're served, like the monks? That's changing the level, like Suzuki Roshi did, always turning things around. Don't get so stuck, don't cling, don't become a fundamentalist about anything. And of course, not wasting and not leaving any trace. Can we remember these on Thanksgiving as a way to be with each other and be with ourselves? So these are just some reflections on this special uh, week and around how we meet food. And I would ask if you have uh, questions about any of this or that maybe it's something that you haven't thought about or maybe you haven't seen this chant. But before we do, uh, I mean, it's ask um, uh, Josh, if you would come forward just for a second. Um, because you have led the, the cooking at Ben Tenzo, I think, um, for so long. And Maria will make, there you go. She's unmuted you. Thank you. Hi, friends. <clears throat> and I wondered if uh, you'd offer uh, just whatever is moving in you as you hear the chant and hear these, these teachings. As, as you were uh, uh, speaking, I was reliving the nine years of being the Tenzo on the annual UK retreat and just what a deep uh, practice it is to be to be in the kitchen so I felt so much gratitude to you for and to the organizing team for inviting me to cook and um, when I first started I, I thought it was a kind of an annex to the to the practice that we mm -hmm. would be we would be cooking for people so that they could practice just support the real practice. <laughs> well, the real practice, and and gradually, year by year, I realized that there there is no separation between the kitchen and the zendo and everything else that goes on. And then, maybe by year three, I realized there's no separation between the zendo, the kitchen, and people laying the table. And so each time there was a kind of, um, for me, a realization of how practice encompasses everything. And the washing up. And the, and the washing up. And um, I, when you talked about food, I remember each time at the beginning of a retreat, the food would arrive on the first morning and we would have table after table after table of food. And we spent several hours putting it away and then after five or six days it had been totally transformed it didn't exist as as that food um the, it had disappeared and become a, a different form and i i was really struck by um what you were saying about suzuki roshi because i i notice one of the the teachings of his I take around is in activity there should be calmness and in calmness there should be activity and I kind of noticed during the nine years sometimes when I was just you know my bow wasn't strung right you know there's a and um, for some people who were uh, tending to drift towards calmness we needed to say we have to get a meal out by half past six 
<laughs> we, we need to we need to do something here and people who were uh, maybe straying towards activity and busyness this you know we need to slow this down there's no hurry <laughs> so it was something about what's the appropriateness of each moment in the kitchen in relation to the practice and the activity and what we've actually got to achieve at the end mm -hmm. and I, I you know it was such a complete practice for me that um I learned so much about myself and about mm -hmm. about this practice and about life from it. Um, and the inevitable um, surprises one might call a mistake or mm. something going wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the worst thing was um, what I would call quiche gate when I'd planned so carefully to create these beautiful quiches <laughs> and um, I I was so ashamed when they weren't on time and they weren't right. And I learned so much. And I remember you saying, it's just a quiche. <laughs> but I was, you know, it really brought up issues for me around um, being an imposter. You know, you can't, I couldn't even make pastry. <laughs> so those little things really... Um, uh, confront you and allow you to to understand where you're coming from and how you can just uh, go down on your knees and get up again. That's, that's our practice. Mm. Mm. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I, I remember I think that first year at Broadhow, the first thing I gave you was a copy of the Tinsel Kyokan. That's right, yeah. Yeah. I treasure I'm it. all marked up. <laughs> have your underlinings on it. And that was the first time I realized, oh, this is this is more than I I thought I was just here to cook a few meals, you know. <laughs> this is more than I, I imagined. Um, and I remember the whole of that time in Broad Howe, I was so attentive all the time until the very last meal. The door the door is about five feet ten and I'm six feet one. And I, I was so pleased that we were coming towards the end of the retreat and I hit my head on the door as I came through. <laughs> it's like one continuous mistake. That's right. Yeah, pay attention. Mm. Thank you for your for your comments. Thank you. It's, it, these things are really, really important. Mm. Deep in us, too. Mm. <clears throat> Hello. Hi, Becky. Hi. Uh, first of all, Thanksgiving is in the air. I just want to say again to you and Peg, thank you for planting the seeds of Apamata um, and, and how wonderful it is to, to be there at a time when so much, so much is strong and love and, and uh, yeah. Uh, so just because it's, your Thanksgiving. I just wanted to say that my Thanksgiving. Um, I I really uh, this is a wonderful wonderful topic and and Dharma talk that you just gave in relationship to it. Um, as as a lot of you know, I have been on a, an amazing nine year journey uh, from when I first was aware that I had cancer that was already metastasized and made a decision that I wasn't going to follow conventional treatment, um, that I would take responsibility for um, my health uh, while I would look to others to, you know, give me guidance or, or whatever, but, um, and in, I mean, the first thing I did was I sat with myself to make sure that I was at peace with the possibility that the outcome of that would be that I died when I might not have needed to, or, you know, all of those things. And, and, um, and the second clear thing for me was that, um, that I have long believed that our, our bodies ha are made for healing. Uh, for healing themselves, if we can give them the right resources. Mm -hmm. And 
those resources are many, not just food, not just medicinal intake in that sort of way. Um, and so I, I, you know, said about this, I, I didn't follow anybody's um, protocol for getting rid of cancer. I, I just spent a lot of time thinking about what every part of it was. And one of the things that was real important to me really soon was to, was to really feel like I, like every time I, I fed myself to make sure that it was something completely beautiful and amazing, mm -hmm. even when it was the simplest thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, my mom's training about always make sure there's at least three colors on the plate and, you know, all of these different things came in handy when it, when it was about that. Um, and yes, um, I mean, I grew up on a farm, so I know where food comes from and how much work's involved in it and, and so on. And so it has always been part of my giving thanks for the food. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was so ex like, when, when I first saw that in the chant book, I've only, I've only been with Appamata and had a practice for less than two years now. Um, but when I saw that chant, when I was looking, I haven't had the opportunity to eat with you all. Mm -hmm. but, but when I saw the chant, it just made me very, very happy knowing, because like before that, like you'd said, save the body, right? And I'm going, it's more than saving it. It's, it's much more than saving it that we're doing. Um, and, and so when I saw that, I went, oh, that's, that's really beautiful. That's exactly right. And there's so many things that I've, that I've come across that had been part of my, what I called praxis, um, that, that, that are so enriched by the teachings mm -hmm. uh, and 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 expanded by my practice anyway so that was just something that is is also just i mean yeah it's, it's amazing uh, <laughs> and um the thing that i ran into recently that i don't i mean it hit a practice edge but it I, it didn't throw me completely over it but it when you were talking today about some of the things that that the teachers had had done to make sure that people weren't just being sort of self-righteous and trying to change each other's lives about about food and so on which is a disgusting way of trying to share with people something that you know that you believe is by trying to, you know being self-righteous about it more really and so um a couple of weeks ago, uh, yeah, a week and a half ago was was my my seventy fifth birthday, and my daughter made a magnificent. Happy birthday. Thank you, thank you, and my daughter made a magnificent meal, and then when we got to the part where she had made the brownies, which has long been my very favorite thing, and she, and you know, I knew that she'd gotten sort of all organic stuff on my behalf, and pick you know foods and did them in a way and all of that and when it when it got to the, the the brownie thing she said something about uh she didn't use as much sugar and i'm going oh you use like regular sugar in it kind of thing in my head and i'm sort of like and then i had this period of time where i i sat trying to figure out what i was going to do was i going to and eat sugar which you know in in my fixed mind about things is that sugar feeds cancer and you stay away from it now right and so I went through this process and then I said oh you know I I I really am glad to be able to to uh, share this but I'm only going to eat a very little of it with you and so I'd gotten through that part. I figured out what I wanted to do and so on. Um, but the next day she came to me and said, essentially, um, 
it ruined everything. And I said, well, what do you mean? And she said that, that the period of time where I was just trying to figure out what I would, how I was going to react, that she went, I, I guess what happened, I mean, my guess from here is that what happened for her was that she felt disappointed because she wanted to make it totally perfect. In, you know, and so she interpreted my processing things and, and so on as my disappointment and a whole lot of other things. And then came to me with a lecture about how I need to take responsibility for my impact on other people. So, you know, it, it was, it was really a tricky, really tricky moment. And it stayed with me as something that churned for a few days. Um, but I mean, ultimately, I, I, I know that what I was thinking and what my intent was when I did it. And I shared that with her as an immediate response. Um, and she still basically feels that, that my having a look on my face uh, and whatever it was that she was interpreting, um, that I should do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen you so full of energy. You're very energetic today. Well, yeah, I guess I am. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really good to see you so full of life. Yes, life is wonderful. No Just doubt about that. To hear both your gratitude and the struggle, because that's life, isn't it? We have deep gratitude for things, and yet we have struggled. And you have all this life energy today and all this uh, energy of, of connection and care both for yourself and for your daughter. And those principles that I was talking about of meeting on common ground, like where, where do we meet? We meet because we want to share a good time together and to be respectful to each other. Sometimes somebody will be that way, sometimes they may not, but you can be respectful like you did. And then to change the conversation. Who knows what's more destructive, eating a little bit of sugar or having anxiety? Yeah. But, you're, but you, uh, you're continuing to try to not get rid of something, cancer. You're trying to support your life. That's right. And that, that's the changing of the conversation, those three principles we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And thank you for sharing all of this and for letting us see more of you, because we've only seen a little of you sometimes. We get to hear more of who you are and to know about your life. Happy birthday, and may you be very, very, very well. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> I was wondering if um, I, th I thought about this previously. If uh, Peg, would you mind stepping up just for a minute for us to speak? Hi. Hey, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Part of the reason I wanted to invite you is after listening to. Josh a little bit as well. <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, thank you for the endless menus that you prepared. <laughs> and uh, even in the early, early days when we were at Austin Zen Center or other th other times at, at Appamata in the beginning when you were teaching and being a Tenzo at the same time. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> Because this thing in the kitchen and about food is underappreciated, I think, sometimes. It was really a, a, just a wonderful time, a wonderful experience of um, nourishing people in the different ways that I felt able to nourish them. So um, for me, it, it's a gift um, to have something to offer mm -hmm. and, um, and something that um, I could see would be a benefit mm -hmm. in people's lives. So, and a very practical, you know, like um, biological level of food, and then the spiritual level of the teachings of the Buddha, so nourishing. Yeah. 
So it felt um, quite seamless in a way. Um, although it was, um, I know it was a lot <clears throat> literally on your plate <laughs> those days. <laughs> Were you oh, yeah. someone, I'd be doing practice discussion and someone would knock on the door and say, we can't figure out how to turn on the oven. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you were also in the kitchen at Great Val when you were in the monastery too, right? Yeah, that was, uh, that was a fabulous kitchen. That was a, it was, uh, uh, Great Val is, uh, was formerly an elementary school. So they had a giant kitchen filled with stainless steel counters and walk-in coolers. And it was a fantastic arena for, uh, for, all of us cooking, and then they had a big organic garden. So it was a wonderful experience being the Tenzo there and, uh, and just a delight uh, to be in the kitchen, which was also warm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so it was, it was very, you know, and when we started doing intensives together and we were um, teaching people how to take on those roles in the kitchen, and it was so much fun to see them flourish and blossom and under those, sometimes very high stress conditions. Um, lots of folks had never cooked for a lot of people mm -hmm. and, uh, and they were so um, loyal and faithful to their role. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody ever, you know, flung down their apron and said, I'm not doing this. Um, you can't make me do this. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but it was wonderful to see them um, beginning to realize as Josh did what practice this work is. Yeah, people were um, would commonly come into the Zendo when they're brand new and worry about, could I do the form? Am I bowing the right time? I, da, da, da. But when you're in the kitchen, you actually realize, oh, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's not different. And then you begin to see, oh, it's every moment in life. And yeah. I think that's the, the beauty of it. And, and to a person, people have come out of the intensives who have been working in the kitchen saying, that was powerful practice. Yeah. And, and the way that you relate with others in the service of this larger task, mm -hmm. um, when things go awry or when, um, you know, when you don't know quite what to do or when you have a better idea, but you have to just follow the Tenzo. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's such a good training in everything that this practice has to offer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And it was fun, you know, working with you to figure out, you know, um, how we were going to manage food in these different environments at Red Corral Ranch or, you know, wherever we were, you know, the, you know, the different venues where we were having our intensives and figure out what, what the kitchen could support, you know. Um, the, the rules up at Lotus Lake where there was not a single thing. We had to bring every pot, every spoon, every utensil. Yeah. Um, just the logistics of planning all of that was really um, such a pleasure. Yeah. You know, there's the turn, the sort of turns in the teachings that I was using in those small teaching stories from Suzuki Roshi. Would you say one about, uh, because I know there's one uh, powerful one about Joko, her surprise, so people don't get attached to thinking they're going to have a beautiful meal. Yeah, we'd have um, five day intensives. And every single breakfast was exactly the same. Every single breakfast was exactly the same. Every single evening, exactly the same. Um, very simple, very nutritious. Um, but people stop, stopped anticipating. You know, they stopped thinking about, well, what are we going to have for lunch? Or, you know, how, how's lunch going to be? And um, will it be something I like? Or will it be something I don't like? You know, people dropped all their preferences by the end of an intensive altogether. People who, you know didn't think they had any fondness for tofu became absolutely captivated by it. You know, it was really wonderful. All of it very, very, and she had, um, had it just down to a science as far as preparation. So every meal came out on time because it was exactly the same meal. Nobody was at sea about what was going to be prepared. Um, and the recipes were quite simple. So um, it was a, it was a brilliant way to do it because we have so much wrapped up around our food preferences, our food stylings, um, wanting a lot of variety, expecting a lot of variety in our meals and um, imagining that a retreat is going to be like a spa, you know? Um, and, and it was quite, um, it, it pretty much defeated everybody's expectations in a wonderful way. Well, it certainly revealed them just as sitting facing a wall does. Yes. It reveals your preferences. 
Yes, yes, you know, and um, and it was, and you became so appreciative. Well, that's the thing. It's not that it's useful to be ascetic or something. It's that it helps you understand the appreciation of. Yeah. So, well, thanks for those reflections. I knew that they were important, and I wanted to hear from you. Yeah, of course, it was. Um, it's just, uh, it's such a wonderful compliment to practice. Mm -hmm. um, to be able to serve in that way. Yeah. And all the people who served, the cleanup crews, the people who did yeah. shopping before the intensive and made soups and things before the intensive so that, um, so that the intensive could happen. Even people who were not going to be at the intensive. It was quite a wonderful experience. Yeah, thank Enjoy you. Enjoy your Thanksgiving with your family. Thank you, I'm gonna have two Thanksgivings. Yep, one with my sister's family and one with my son's family, so. Imagine more fasting lies ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much. Take care. Give Aaron a big hug from me. I have Ben. Oh, good. I haven't gotten to talk to Ben in a long time. Hello. Hi, Flint. Can you hear me? It's so good to see you. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. It's great, great to see you. It's been uh, it's been a long time. I've been sat yeah. in the wings, just observing very quietly. And uh, yeah, well, I'm in an awe whether I should press the little uh, the little hand or not. I've seen you in there. I've seen your name and knew you were with us. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I do have a, I have a, I do have a question, um, and it loosely links to this, this aspect of transformation, and it's been something that I would say has been uh, plaguing me. Would be the right, maybe the right word for for a long, long time, and um, perhaps even since the last um, time I sat in the inner circle, if you recall. Mm -hmm. back at my very first retreat and I, I, to to coin a I, I guess it's um one of the zen stories that i've i've heard on many occasions that i feel like i could listen to you for a thousand years and still not get this stuff mm -hmm. you know and <clears throat> On one hand, we, we talk about Zazen being um, this, we're not trying to do anything, we're not trying to get anywhere. And then on the other hand, we all kind of know that we are trying to get somewhere, we are trying to uh, you know, transform, develop, move forward. Um, and I, I just feel so stuck. And I think you used the word stuck in your... Um, in your talk uh, earlier and that really resonated and also linking back to the last online retreat I found myself towards the end of that just going away and having quite an ab reaction and feeling quite angry because I'd listened to all these amazing people including yourself and Josh and Catherine and other people um, mm -hmm. and and it's like it feels like sometimes you're describing the water you know and I'm, I'm I we're the ones drowning or I'm drowning and you're describing the water I'm like I get I, I get it you know our conditioning is strong and all of these these aspects but yet I feel so more so now than ever caught up in the mm -hmm. self-centered dream mm -hmm. like right in the middle of in the in the mix of it and why do you come back I, well, I love hearing you talk and you got a great smile. Okay. But that's actually part of the answer. And it isn't about me. Something gets set up between us. Like it did that day when you were sitting knee to knee with me in the middle of the circle. And something begins to move that you can't quite describe and you can't quite put your finger on. And it doesn't solve all the problems in your life. And yet you keep coming back to it. 
because there's something there for you. It's not just pleasurable. It's not entertaining. It's, it's calling something up in you that's deeper. And that you don't seem to turn away from, even if you can't understand what it is. Mm. And you do things to help people in very direct ways because you're a trainer and a coach and you help people in those ways you can see. And I'm a trainer and a coach too, but in ways that sometimes are harder. But the, the longing that you respond to that brings us into this place of a smile and a nice voice in these teachings it's a mystery, and yet you keep following it. And that's something that I think we should talk more about. We're at the end of our time today, but you're asking, sure. the, you're asking the essential question of practice. So I don't want to shortchange it or miss it. It's really important. Sure. And I think that bringing it up this way and being as full in your expression of it as you are is you're speaking for a lot of people. So let's follow with this, okay? In fact, send me a little note. Tell me what I should talk about next time. In the next inquiry. Who, who me? Yes, you. T tell you what you should talk about. <laughs> give me some advice for next time, okay? I'll wait for your email. I will give it some uh, some consideration. It's so good to see you. Mm -hmm. Good to see you. Yeah. I'm going to share my screen again uh, with the, the meal chant for us to end, but we're just going to do the last little bit that we do um, once we've finished the longer chant. See this down at the bottom? Because this speaks about what you're touching on, that we, we exist both as the beauty of awakening and we're caught in the muck all the time. And there, that's the tension that we're talking about. So let's see, say these two lines together, all of us. May we exist like a lotus at home in the muddy water. Thus we bow to life as it is. Ben and I exist like lotuses at home in the muddy water. And we bow to each other because this is the way life is. Thank you so much. Maria, my friend. <laughs> Thank you so much, Flint. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And Appamada and its programs and facilities are supported through your generosity. Your support makes a huge difference. You'll find a link for contributions on the website at appamada.org forward slash contribute. Here you'll see an opportunity to offer Dana to teachers such as Flint and Peg, as well as other teachers. You'll also see an opportunity to contribute towards events and class, such as classes and practice discussions. And thank you all so much for, for joining us today. And if you'd like to continue to meet and share, please stay right where you are and join myself and others on the virtual porch. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And I hope to see some of you very soon. And if you'd like to go into gallery view to either join after inquiry or to wave your friends goodbye, then please do. <laughs>